Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to webinar four in the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Developments Financial Intel Intelligence webinar series. It will also help this time round, as per my sort of opening written comments, that if you have your notes uh, for webinar four and the homework for webinar four available to you. Uh, as we will be referring to them as we go through the webinar itself. Let's just recap where we are in this series of four webinars, only one to go after this one. And we started by making sure that we understand some of our financial basics and that we have quality information feeding into our decision making. And that was in the form of three financial statements, a profit and loss, a balance sheet and a cash flow. And whilst you might have been familiar with the cash flow, the profit and loss and balance sheet may have been uh, reasonably new concepts to get a grasp upon, but they help identify the uh, overall financial health of um, the business and the strengths and weaknesses once we start to look at some ratios. Um, and we spent a quite a bit of time in webinar three looking at the profit and loss and cost of production. Uh, in webinar two, we looked at those financial um, health check, if you like, and the financial ratios, especially around the medium to long term situation of your farm, trying to head towards sustainably growing the wealth of the owners, the equity portion of the balance sheet and its profit that will grow that uh, equity portion. And we finished up webinar two, uh, webinar two by looking at, well, what do we do with profit? Do we leave it in the business and reduce debt, invest in things? Do we take it out of the business, off farm investments, preparing for retirement, uh, rewarding the owners for the risk they have taken? And how do we get that balance sort of right? And having set those longer term sort of objectives of sustainably growing the owner's wealth, uh, making those decisions about what we're doing with the profit in, in, uh, in each year as heading towards those longer term sort of goals that we have. Then last week, we looked at those medium term financial decisions, maybe those financial decisions that span operating cycles, maybe the one to three years sort of thing, depends on the cycles within your farm. And we looked at costs of production and, um, and the decisions we make about revenue and overheads in particular can take that one to three years to have a, a real impact. Well, we need to optimize them over that time rather than just optimize them in one year, which might mean they blow out the next year. So we need to look in that medium term horizon and make sure that the decisions we're making fit in with the longer term goals that we're actually setting. Uh, so this webinar is actually focused on short term financial decisions and making sure they fit in with the medium term and the longer term. So the decisions we make within a season to try and get the most out of a season. So we're gonna focus on the variable costs. So you may remember last week we talked about um, uh, a little rule of thumb in terms of improving the financial performance in your profit and loss. And I think we call it the 615 rule. Thanks very much, Daniel. Uh, his audio and video is working. Uh, good to see you on board. Uh, we talked about the 615 rule and increasing our revenue by 6%, reducing our variable costs by 1% of our turnover or revenue and reducing our overheads by 5%. And last week we looked at options for the revenue and the overheads as their medium term type decisions. Our variable cost decisions uh, are largely in the here and now in the short term. So we're going to be looking at five, uh, the 1%. How can we reduce our variable costs by 1% of our revenues? So not 1% of our var variable costs, but by a ratio of 1% uh, of our revenue and making sure that fits in with our medium and longer term decisions. So we've got three uh, broad sort of outcomes, or sorry, webinar five. Next week, we'll be looking at managing financial risk, which covers all three time horizons. Um, and making sure that we're doing uh, growing the owner's wealth sustainably. I guess we could take a lot of risks, but that may not be sustainable. So managing financial risks is next week. So we've got three broad um, outcomes that we're looking to get from this week's webinar. And the first one is around understanding those variable costs and margins. And you may remember from webinar one that a margin is our revenue minus our variable costs. So all the costs that go up and down with how busy we are, the variable costs, how much we're producing, they go up and down uh, and we take that away from our revenue. Uh, and that gives us a gross margin. And from gross margins, we take overheads 
and that leaves us with an operating profit before tax, earnings before interest and tax, and drawings, if you like, EBIT is what we've referred to. So variable costs and margins can be impacted by short-term decisions around productivity. And we'll define productivity in a minute. It's about being more efficient in your farming operations to get the most, the biggest bang for your buck, if you like. Um, and increased productivity, here's our definition, is about improving the ratio of inputs to outputs. That's an important definition because it gives you a range of options to be more efficient and more productive. It's not just about generating more revenue or cutting costs. There are other things we can do and we'll define those in a minute when we get into the webinar. And just to point out, there may be a typo in your slides. Uh, instead of of, I think it says PF. So I've changed it in my slides there. And the last one uh, is, uh, is the banker coming out in me. Um, it's an old saying that accountants have and even bankers have, you know, income is vanity, profit is sanity, cash is reality. You can't change cash. And in webinar one, we looked at these uh, notional entries we made up to match revenue with expenses changes in our inventory levels, in our stocking levels, and also the timing in receipts of payments and making payments. And we made up entries we, to match revenue with expenses. Importantly, when we were doing that, our balance sheet and our profit and loss changed, but what doesn't change is your cash flow. Cash is reality. You can't change how much money you have in the bank. You've got to sell more stuff. You've got to collect the money uh, before it's worth anything. Um, so cash is that reality. And if we don't have enough cash, we can't pay the bills. Uh, and banks are very interested in that part of the equation. So whilst profit is important for those medium term decisions and will retain your sanity, um, maybe we may be better off actually making less sales, but more profit and be in a better cash position. And that's a challenging concept in terms of we generally accept, uh, no, no, it's about more revenue but maybe revenue isn't the important bit. It's about the balance between revenue, costs, and the cash that that, that helps generate. Uh, I've done quite a bit of work with news agents in the past, and believe it or not, they make about 8% on a lotto ticket. So on a $10 lotto ticket, they're making 80 cents. But if they sell a chocolate bar for $3, they're making $1.50. So their margin on chocolate bars is a lot better than on lotto tickets. The success of a news agent is about how many chocolate bars, magazines, pens they sell, not how, how many lotto tickets they sell. And in fact, they might be better off selling less lotto tickets and more of the others. And that is uh, their income goes down, but their profit and cash position is actually improved. Have a think about your farm and uh, whilst revenue is generally accepted as, well, that will flow through to more profit, that may not always be the case. So have a think about that um, and how you can be more profitable rather than have more revenue. Okay, so let's get into the content for this week's uh, webinar. Now we've looked at the learning outcomes and we've positioned things and we have looked at benchmarks before and I guess we need to take some benchmarks with a grain of salt. Uh, and we talked about benchmarking yourself rather than to others. But as a starting point and as a slide and to highlight a certain point, I've uh, included uh, some information from Bank West Benchmarks in their Plan Farm uh, uh, website. And there's a link to this provided in your references. And this is for MRS3 rainfall, uh, a bit of an average, I guess, rainfall sort of area. And it's a whole of farm uh, identification of the variable costs involved in this particular farm. So I haven't put it up there to say, this is what your cost should be. I'll put it up there to show a couple of key points. A, the nature of variable costs, fertilizers, crop protection, grain handling and levies, uh, cartage, uh, even repairs and maintenance. The busier you are, maybe the more repairs and maintenance you actually need, etc. And the second thing I want to show is that if you look at the top four, the top three or four variable costs, generally account for 60 to 70% of all of your variable costs. So if we look at the top four here, um, fertilizer, crop protection, grain handling, repairs and maintenance, it actually adds up to about 67.6%. So just under that 
And the reason I highlight that is that this is a good place to start in terms of managing your variable costs to look at the big ticket items. Um, if only three or four are covering 60 to 70% of all of your costs, then the most gains you're going to make are on those big ticket items. And a reminder, the variable costs are the costs that go up and down with how busy you are. So it may be the amount, the cost of seed uh, if you plant more hectares, or the cost of shearing if you shear more sheep, if you have more sheep. So generally, fertilizer will go up and down with how much you plant in terms of hectares and or the nature of the crops. So it's not a direct relationship, but it's a general sort of relationship. So my question to you is to think about your farm, which may not be exactly the same as these benchmarks, but what are your top three or four? How do they compare to other similar farms? How do they compare to the past, what you've been doing in the past? What should they be in the future if you were to optimize your costs? And optimizing is about a balance between the, the revenue it helps you generate and the costs that you're actually incurring. Uh, are you trying to sell more lotto tickets, but only making 8% when maybe you should be thinking about um, the chocolate bars to a degree? Uh, a very city boy sort of analogy, but uh, that's the best I can do. Um, so what are your top three to four costs? There's a good place to actually start in terms of analyzing your variable costs. And the sort of decisions you can make are around your variable costs once you have a good handle on them and understand them quite well. Uh, and hopefully at the end of this webinar, you'll be thinking seriously about some of these decisions. Uh, together with your cost of production, variable costs feed into your enterprise mix. Um, now, it's a financial consideration that you add to the environment, the marketplace and and farming issues, but it's an important consideration to get the right balance and mix right for the medium to longer term. So think about your variable costs uh, as feeding into that enterprise mix type decisions. Variable costs are quite important within the season of making these what if type decisions, the so-called sensitivity analysis, if you like. So there's an example in uh, the PowerPoint there, and we give you a scenario where canola sells at 500 a tonne, and you're expecting a yield of two tonnes a hectare, and your variable costs are 550 a hectare. So at the start of the season, we might be thinking, well, how much do we plant to canola? Um, should we plant extra? Should we plant less? Should we change uh, our mix within the enterprises that we have on the farm? Uh, what would be the impact if prices were to go up by 5% if our yield was 5% better and or there was a reduction of 5% in our variable costs. So we can change any one of those uh, criteria because our original estimate says 500 a tonne times two tonnes a hectare minus the 550 variable costs means we'd be making a gross margin, that is our revenue minus our variable costs per hectare of 450 for the canola. But if price went up by 5%, instead of getting 500, we'll be getting 525 for our um, uh, per ton for canola. We multiply by the two tons because the yield hasn't changed and we take away the 550, our variable costs, and now we're making $500 a hectare um, for our canola. What if yield was 5% better? So we may not be able to control price, but we might have a, a feel that we've been particularly conservative in that price and there is an upside. But maybe if we invested a little bit more or change things around, we might be able to improve our yield. So in this case, the 500 a tonne, the price remains the same, but our yield goes up by 5% to 2.1 tonnes per hectare. If we take away our $550 variable costs per Hectare, we end up with 500. So a similar result with yield and price. And both of those are $50 better per hectare than our original estimate. So to get a 5% improvement in yield, if it was costing us $10 a hectare to do that, and there was an 80 or 90% chance of getting a, uh, an improvement in our yield of 5%, that 10% improvement in our variable costs or increase in our variable costs to um, would be um, taking our variable costs from 550 to 605. 
So we'd have to stop and think, well, is it really worth a 10% improvement um, in our variable costs to improve our yield by 5%? So you can sort of see the decisions we're making. And the last one is around uh, our variable costs. And if we were to re reduce those by 5%, our original estimate of 500 a ton times two, hec two tons per hectare. And then we take off the um, increase uh, in our variable costs. And um, I can see we've actually got those numbers around the, the wrong way there. So there's a bit of a typo there, which I'll have to fix up as, as uh, no, actually, they, they are correct. So it goes from 550 down to 522.50, take the 5% off our variable costs. And you can see that uh, we're at 477.50 per hectare, which is $27.50 better per hectare than our original estimate but it's not the $50 better in our yield and our price. So our, our, um, our short-term decisions around price and yield will have a generally a bigger impact than in variable costs, but there's a lot more chance involved in price and yield. Whereas if we can control our variable costs, there's a lot more certainty. If we can make them 5% uh, cheaper with a 90% certainty, I don't know that we can get 90% certain about price and yield. So whilst it seems as if they're not as important, um, I think if we take into, it, into account risk, which we'll be looking at next week, you can see that, uh, I don't know, I, I'm not one to, to go to the casino too much, but 100% chance of getting a $27.50 improvement might be better than a 30 or 40% chance of getting a $50 improvement. I think the key is to maybe focus on all three of these and go, how do I maximize the price? How do I get a better yield? But how do I control my variable costs? So they're the three decisions that we're considering uh, in our short-term type decisions. And the last sort of decisions we might want to make around variable costs have to do with the amount of working capital we need. And you may remember from webinar two, the ratio of working capital was we take our current assets and we take away our current liabilities. Current assets turn into cash in the next 12 months and current liabilities uh, need to be paid in the next 12 months. So the big one here is we need to fund that working capital because we may not have the cash to actually do it. And that means going to the bank and increasing our overdraft if we don't have the reserves to cover that. So if we wanted to put in an extra 500 hectares uh, of canola, and that's costing us in variable costs an extra $100 a tonne compared to uh, wheat, then the 500 hectares times the $100 a tonne is $50,000 more working capital is required. Now we'd have to work that into our financial calculations because to borrow 50,000 for let's say nine months of the year, uh, and let's say, let's keep it in, uh, simple and make it 10% uh, of 50 is five grand, uh, for nine months of the year, three quarters of five um, to do, you know, 3,750, somewhere around there. Um, so is it going to generate and cover that extra interest? Do I have access to that extra uh, capacity to borrow the 50,000? Sort of decisions we start to try and make around our uh, variable costs. Now, just a reminder around variable costs, we're just looking in the short term. We're not looking in the medium or longer term and we're not thinking about uh, overheads. So we're not talking about profit here. We're talking about short term decisions. Um, we need to think about the whole of farm as well as enterprise variable costs. Um, and there are some uh, issues in just focusing on, focusing on a single season rather than on multiple seasons to try and optimize our profit. But in the short term, uh, decisions around variable costs are very important, especially to do with our bank balance. So I'm going to take a bit of a breather there because I've been talking for a while. I'll have a sip of water. Uh, any questions anyone has so far around variable costs and the sorts of decisions you can make and the sorts of costs we're actually talking about? I'll give you a minute to actually type. I can't see anyone uh, typing at this point in time, so we'll continue on and uh, have a look at our next slide here. 
Now, uh, I've previously said that to make good decisions around variable costs, you need to understand how they behave. So I think some variable costs are catalysts to a good outcome, a good price and a good yield. Um, they promote the positive fertilizer, seeding rate, that sort of thing. Some variable costs are dependent upon your yield and how much you actually produce. So they'll go up and down with, um, uh, and maybe freight is a really good example of this. Uh, and if you are involved in marketing uh, expenses and levies and that sort of thing. Some variable costs are sort of independent. We, we spend money on them hoping that they will uh, drive more uh, volume, but there may not be any guarantees. And some variable costs uh, affect yield quite directly. They're like an insurance and they affect it by avoiding the negative. Uh, and you can see some of the examples actually there. So the relationship's not always straightforward because we've been saying variable costs have a relationship to your volumes of outcomes, uh, tons, kilos, that sort of thing. But in effect, uh, the relationship is, a, is more aligned to yield than it is directly to outcomes. And understanding that in terms of your risk profile and in terms of making the decisions that you make can be quite important. How much you spend on these sorts of things, uh, really coming back to farming decisions and the quality of farming decisions that you make and working with partners like your farm consultants to work out the optimum level, maybe not the, uh, the most that will get the absolute best outcome because you might be overspending. So we don't want to overspend and we don't want to underspend. Um, just like Goldilocks, get it just right in the middle somehow. And that is an art in doing that. So think about the variable costs and the nature of those variable costs, not just that they go up and down with your um, volumes of production, but also in that they uh, do that by impacting yield or being impacted by yield. Now, we said that uh, efficiency and improving our variable costs through efficiency and productivity has to do with, uh, there's five different ways that you can actually do it. Uh, let me just go through them one by one. And most people start with, um, what if I produce more and spend less? The old more with less. But there's about four other different ways that you can actually do it. Sometimes we need to invest. We need to spend more to improve the chances of getting more in outcomes. And as long as the more outputs are larger than the inputs, we are being more efficient and we've improved our ratio. Um, we could also be more efficient by using the same amount of inputs and getting more outputs. And that will improve the ratio between inputs and outputs with the same amount of fertilizer, with the same amount of um, insecticide, we're getting more outcomes. Here we're talking about maybe um, uh, investing more in the size of our flock and as long as that investment drives more outputs than we actually invested, then we're going to be better off. Um, sometimes we can be more profitable by spending less. As long as the amount we spend or the inputs, and largely we're talking about dollars and converting those into dollars, that the inputs or costs or cash outflows are larger, the reduction is larger than the reduction in our outcomes. So sometimes it's about focusing our efforts and uh, concentrating where we're spending our time and effort and energy. And this might involve spending less and producing a bit less. But as long as we're saving 50,000 uh, and our revenue is only dropping 10,000, then we're gonna be 40,000 uh, better off. So are there some in really inefficient uh, uh, areas of your business here? Uh, definitely we want to reduce waste. And this is a key one for us. If we can spend less, but get the same in terms of the production and revenue, then we're gonna be more efficient. And the most common one people do is a, is a combination of all of these where they aim to spend less on the variable costs, but achieve more in terms of outcomes. Now this may not always be possible, but it might be the goal that people sort of start with. And the reason people start with this goal is that it builds in a contingency plan. That is, if I end up spending less, 
but I don't achieve more in outcomes, I'm still going to be better off. If I achieve more in outcomes, but I haven't spent less, I've spent the same, I'm still going to be better off. So this might be the one you aim for, but you might end up with one of these uh, in your uh, in the end result. So it's an interesting way to look at your inputs into the farm and the outputs from the farm to try and make sure that you are optimizing uh, your variable costs that are going into it and maybe even building in some contingencies by having a not putting all your eggs in one basket putting them in a few different baskets so this is the way that we need to look at our uh, reducing our variable costs um, by that one percent of our revenue uh, so just a problem with my uh, technology problem here at this end so my slides have disappeared I'll just get them back up um, just bear with me so whilst I'm just getting those slides up if anyone has any other other questions uh, please uh, type them in now my apologies that I just uh, knocked a cord and uh, the PowerPoint disappeared. So it's just coming back up. No questions. There we go, I think normal uh, transmission has been resumed or as normal as I get. So I think that's the slide we were looking at before I rudely interrupted things. Um, so this is how we're going to look at to try and reduce our variable costs by that 1% of our revenue. And I wanna focus a little bit more on that reducing wastes. And this is where your homework will come in handy. So if you have your homework actually with you, uh, there's a lot more detail provided in the homework because we start to move into um, areas of uh, that are more farming related than finance related because in the end it is these farming decisions which are going to reduce the variable costs that you have. Now there's a philosophy in uh, Japan about continuous improvement called Keitsen and it, it has to do with the seven wastes involved in any business. So what I've done is I've taken those wastes and abbreviated them to five to end up with some headings. And those headings are in your homework there about some options you have in terms of trying to reduce your variable costs. So you can see the first one there is getting the timing right. So this has to do with you being proactive and you planning things up front um, such that you can address issues as and when they arise. It's about avoiding waiting and downtime and delays because you've planned and been proactive up front. And you can see some farming examples in your homework. And in your homework, we're going to be asking you to say, well, which ones of these might actually help you in terms of reducing your variable costs? Do you do this um, well? Are you flexible enough? Are you focusing in on the 101% improvements that you can make on the farm rather than the two or three, 20 or 30% improvements? because it tends to be the cumulative effect of the small decisions you make that will have a big impact in terms of being more efficient uh, and having those variable costs reduce. So the second one we talk about um, is matching supply with demand. So what we're talking about here is avoiding things like double handling. We're avoiding things like too much labor on the farm, ordering too many chemicals. We're, 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 we're talking about the overspending and the underspending I mentioned before. And I guess things can be wasted if you have too much or if you don't have enough and you haven't bought in bulk and you have to buy at short notice, uh, that can be a waste as well. So spend some time matching how much you need with how much you're going to use and the cost of doing that and optimize that level of spending. So there's more specific details in your homework there. Um, thirdly, uh, and this might seem obvious, but mistakes cost money. 
So what can we do to try and avoid them? Now, some mistakes are unavoidable and there's nothing we can do. But there's some things with a bit of thought beforehand, with a bit of training, with a bit of uh, uh, feedback, um, with a bit of avoiding some of those negative uh, aspects we talked about in the nature of variable costs and yield in terms of the use of insecticides and herbicides and fungicides and drenching and all those sorts of things. They're like an insurance policy to avoid mistakes, costly mistakes. But it goes broader than that in terms of uh, supervision, uh, training, feedback, to staff and others working on the farm. So you've got some examples in your homework there. Fourthly, optimize your resources. What is the best mix? So not what is the greatest income, what will drive the greatest income, but for each dollar I spend, what will give me the best return in terms of my gross margin? How do I improve that percentage of variable costs to revenue by lowering it? So it's about matching uh, quality and volume with cost it's about value for money. It's about maybe thinking about some of those things that promote the positive that we talked about, the variable costs that promote the positive and affecting yield, fertilizer, seeding rates, the catalysts to a good outcome, and what is our optimal sort of level. And the last one we looked at is improving logistics, the use of technology, bulk buying, transportation, movement, uh, some of those um, uh, costs involved in the day-to-day -day operational logistics of the farm and what can I do and this will have a big impact I guess in terms of things like cartage and fuel and oil and those sorts of things. So if you look at your homework activity you'll also see that directly underneath that um, list of suggestions around um, those types of focuses to reduce your variable costs we also have um, some specific suggestions around livestock and also around cropping. So not really for me to get into, that's more about uh, uh, your own farming knowledge and expertise and indeed working with consultants and trying to get that right. And it's a real art and skill I would imagine to get that right. So uh, I might just uh, give people a bit of a break there. We've been going sort of according to my uh, watch here, 36 minutes. So it might be good to stretch the legs, grab a cup of tea, go to the loo, whatever. Um, and we'll be back underway in five minutes. And the five minutes, uh, five minutes is up. Hopefully people manage to uh, grab a cup or something. Um, so yeah, any questions so far um, before we sort of head into the, the next section, which is, which is about, well, how do I monitor and see if I'm improving my variable costs uh, within the season? How do I monitor some of these short-term decisions? So what we're going to look at here is a uh, cash flow and some basic principles around preparing a good cash flow. Um, and I'm aware that many people are probably more familiar with the cash flow than they were with the profit and loss and balance sheet. So we won't go into as much detail. We might highlight some of the key principles in building a good profit and loss, uh, sorry, cash flow. Uh, and monitoring that cash flow. Um, your farming software and financial software will often uh, be able to do this fairly well for you as well. So um, let's have a little look at some information around uh, cash flows. So When we looked at our financial health check, we looked at the medium term, the long term and some short term ratios. And our short term ratios tended to be uh, something called a working capital ratio. You take your capital current assets and you divide by your current liabilities. And that was called your working capital ratio. Unfortunately for a farm that is very seasonal in terms of its revenue and expenditure, its cash inflow and its cash outflow, um, this may not be the best way to judge your um, uh, liquidity, your ability to pay your bills when they fall due. Perhaps a better way to do that, uh, definitely a better way to do that, is to prepare a cash flow budget. And what I mean there is that's going to show you month by month what your position is rather than just at one point in the year because our balance sheet is as at one time of the year. So uh, we're going to get a better handle on our cash flow. If we look at um, our liquidity, our ability to pay bills, if we look at a cash flow 
rather than ratios. Uh, and you may remember one of the goals we sort of talked about uh, potentially in the webinar too was it would be lovely if our cash flow was positive during the year. So you ended up with more cash at the end than you did at the start. Um, it would also be very nice if um, you didn't need to use an overdraft uh, because then you wouldn't have to pay interest if you had enough resources. And this might be a good uh, contingency plan uh, if there is a season that isn't uh, as good as you thought it would be. Um, so we have uh, the cash movement, the cash in, the cash out uh, over a 12 month period, month by month is a typical cash flow. And one of the things we need to um, take into account is obviously the seasonality of cash coming in and cash going out um, as we do that. And what it will demonstrate is our ability to pay our bills when they fall due. And this is one of the reasons that a bank is very interested in your cash flow because one of your bills is to repay the interest and principal on your loans. So one of your cash outflows, the interest is an expense, will be in your profit and loss. The repayment is actually a reduction in liability will be in your balance sheet. So this repayment of your loans, whilst it's a cash outflow, is not wholly an expense unless your loan is interest only. So interest only will be an expense, but any repayments, the other side of a repayment is a reduction in your the amount that you owe and also an increase in your expense interest. Okay, so um, uh, one of the differences, I guess, between profit and loss and cash flow. And we're gonna determine our peak overdraft requirements so that we can make sure we're operating within our means uh, by using this cash flow. And we're gonna also make sure that we've got enough money in the bank to pay our bills when they fall due. Um, it will allow us to monitor the impact of our um, uh, strategies around variable costs by highlighting what did we plan to happen in our budget compared to what did actually happen. And that's the main reason you're preparing a budget, not to keep the bank happy, um, albeit that's an important reason. Uh, the main reason you're preparing it is to check that what you thought was going to happen is actually happening. Because what will that, that will allow you to do is throughout the year, if things are going off track, what do I do to get them back on track? this cost is too high. Or alternatively, this is going really well. This cost is a lot lower than what I actually planned. What do I do to continue this cost being lower or this revenue being higher? So what it allows us to do is make decisions throughout the year that try and ensure that we end up at the end of the year with the result that we were aiming for. And it's too late when you get to the end of the year to go back and go, I wish I had done this, I wish I had done that. So our cash flow and comparing actuals to budget will allow us to make some of those calls during the year and make our best efforts to try and achieve our end of year result that we set out to do. So let's look at a sample sort of um, cash flow. So we have cash inflows and in this uh, particular farm we're just looking at some broad headings rather than the detail. We've got some uh, cash inflow from grain, from livestock and some other form of income. And we've done it in thousands and we've done it uh, from March through to February. And you can see maybe there's a, a sort of a late grain payment or a pool payment sort of coming in somewhere here. Um, we've got uh, our livestock and uh, some peaks and troughs there. And we've got some random sort of other income going up and down uh, throughout the year. And that gives us a total inflow. So I should be talking about cash inflows rather than income, sorry. Income would refer to your profit and loss. Here we're talking about cash inflows, two different things, albeit that they may be reasonably closely aligned. Our income will include timing differences where we've sold something, but we don't receive it until later. So if we sold something in February, but don't receive it until March the next year, we would put it in as income, but it's not a cash flow. So. Remember this is cash inflows, money that's hitting your bank account. And we've got some totals there, uh, grain, livestock, other, and a total inflow of cash. Then we've got some outflows, crop, livestock, overheads. Um, now family drawings are definitely an outflow, but they may not be an expense depending upon the structure of your farm. 
and whether it's a company, a partnership, a trust, uh, a sole trader, etc. But they're definitely a cash outflow because we're not talking expenses here. We're talking about money coming out of your bank account, just like we're talking about cash inflows being money going into your bank account. So remember that there can be timing differences uh, and there can be changes in your tradable assets going up and down. And they're two of the big differences between your profit and loss and your cash flow. Also, your cash inflow and cash outflow doesn't include any, um, uh, sorry, your profit and loss doesn't include any cash inflow or outflow in relation to assets, liabilities, or equity. So um, here we would include any cash inflows and outflows. So if we borrowed money from the bank, that would come in as a cash inflow. If we repay money to the bank, that's a cash outflow, even though it may not be an expense when we reduce the principal, just the interest is an expense. And similarly, family drawings is an outflow, but it may not be an expense. So just a brief summary of uh, some of the differences between cash inflows and outflows. So we've got a whole bunch of different um, uh, costs or outflows happening. And we've got some totals month by month down the bottom, just like we have totals in terms of our cash inflows up the top here and some months with no cash inflow. We've got some total cash outflows and you can see they all add up to 384 um, in terms of total outflows. Let's just complete. Um, our uh, position here because if we've only got 337 coming in and we've got 384 going out we're going backwards 46.3 which means if we started with 33,000 in the bank we're going to end up 33 13,300 overdrawn so at face value this cash flow is not good it's going backwards and you can see the peak month by month so I would need to have access to in this case, uh, to allow for uh, timing issues and differences, maybe $150,000 overdraft because our peak uh, position as per these numbers is 128400 In doing this, and if I didn't have access to 150000 maybe I'd need to rearrange the timing of some of the inflows and outflows to try and reduce that peak into uh, by moving some of the uh, outflows into other months and bringing some revenues into some of the quieter months if possible. You can see though that this cash flow does return to credit in two months of the year, 9.9 .9 in December and 23.4 in January before it then ends up overdrawn 13.3 and we started with 33,000 in the bank. Now I say at face value, this is not a good cash flow because it's gone backwards. But if your long to medium term decisions were about uh, investing in the farm and changing how you're doing things and spending more so that you can make more in the medium to long term, then in the short term, you may go backwards in your cash. For example, if you're building up your flock and a lot of these livestock costs related to a build up in your flock and you're not selling those sheep because they'll generate more for you in the future in terms of wool. It may be quite a deliberate ploy to actually uh, invest in the farm to make more. And this might be optimizing your profit and sustainably growing the owner's wealth in the longer term. So hence why we need to be careful about making absolute judgments in terms of uh, short term decisions and the cash flows that they may generate. You'll notice that there's no tax or GST here. I guess there's two options. You could either include GST in all of these figures and then uh, the payments and the BAS payments and all that sort of thing. Generally, GST though is going to have a positive impact on your cash flow um, because you're holding onto the government's money before you send it to them. So this might be a worst case scenario if you leave GST out and it might be simpler to leave GST out. Um, there's no depreciation here because depreciation isn't a cash flow. It is a book entry. And we'll define depreciation more in webinar five, but for the time being, depreciation is the allocation of the purchase price of an asset over its useful life. So if we purchased any assets, they would be in the cash outflows, but the depreciation is not.
Hopefully that will make more sense uh, for those that are struggling with that concept next week when we go into more detail. But just wanted to point that out as one of the major costs that's not reflected as a cash outflow. So hopefully people are reasonably familiar with that sort of format and all the red and bracket numbers are obviously negatives because we've moved into overdraft and the black numbers are the positives. So any questions on the structure of a cash flow, anything you might struggle with? I'll give people a, a minute or so while I take a drink. No one typing, so I think people are reasonably familiar with cash flow. So let's look at the principles of generating a good, strong uh, quality cash flow budget. And I guess that's the first thing we need to point out is that it is a budget. So it is a guess. It's not meant to be 100% accurate. And in fact, if it is 100% accurate, then you're probably lying. <laughs> uh, actually, some things you do know are going to happen might be 100% accurate. But uh, as a banker, anyone who got really close uh, in terms of their budget, I was very suspicious of because it doesn't work that way. It's a guess. But let's try and make it as good a guess as we can. So there's a few key principles. And the first one is the decisions you make and the assumptions you make to generate your cash flow should align to your business plan, your farm plan, your overall plan, your long-term, medium-term plans. It should be a reflection if you are going to change your rotation, change your enterprise mix, uh, invest more, it should be reflected in your budget. You've got two broad choices in terms of generating the figures in your budget. You can start from a, a blank piece of paper, a zero base budget, or you can look at last year's figures, add a bit on, take a bit off, incremental budget. The problem with an incremental budget is it doesn't challenge you to work out whether last year was an optimum expenditure or not. So we might be perpetuating past problems, which is very hard to say uh, early in the morning. We, we might be including errors that we made last year or inefficiencies, but just by taking last year's figures and adding a bit on, taking a bit off. For many of your smaller expenses, this may not be a bad way to do things because it's not going to have a big impact on your budget in the end. And it might be quickest to do it that way. But for some of your major expenditures, so I'm going to suggest those top three or four variable costs, go back to basics and go, how much do we need to spend to get the outcome we're looking for? The best outcome, the most, um, the best quality, the best value. So it may not be the biggest, but the best. So go back to basics in that. And how do I get that cost down? Does it, would it help if I bought in bulk, if I knew that that was the amount that I needed? Um, we need to get the timing right in terms of our budget. So we want to set the budget well in time for the new farming year. We don't want to be setting it in May and June when the farming year started back in February, March. Um, the horse has bolted. We haven't planned things. Um, we're playing catch up. So we should be spending time and getting it ready. And part of that process and the time that you spend is about consulting with other people. So your notes for this uh, unit, webinar four, will contain a bit more information on each one of these dot points. We need to consult with our um, off-farm experts and also people within the farm um, uh, as to their input into the budget. It helps in terms of accuracy. It helps in terms of getting buy-in and commitment to a budget. Second step is around your assumptions. And the essence of a good budget is about the quality of your assumptions. So whenever I see a budget, one of the first questions I ask is, well, what are the assumptions? And you can't publish a budget without those assumptions going with it. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of numbers on a page. But if you tell me where the numbers have come from and the assumptions you've made to get them, then it gives me a sense of the quality of the budget. So we're going to talk about this in the next slide a bit more, but um, we, we've so far used, said, you know, use past results, maybe last three years average. We definitely want to be conservative in terms of these figures. We want to maybe build in some contingencies by being conservative, 
and allowing a little bit of uh, margin of error, if you like. But we need to understand the constraints we're operating within as well. Financial constraints, farming constraints, um, labor, manpower, uh, management constraints, and make sure that our assumptions recognize those as we make them. Thirdly, we need to be good at the mechanics and build the forecast. And often a template or our software will build this for us. And we build it at levels and we need to think about the different levels we build at, the level of detail we're actually going into. As we're doing that, it helps us identify the sensitivities as we ask these what if type questions from an earlier slide. What if I spent a bit less there? What would the impact be? Would it save me money in the end? And this helps us identify the key success factors that are underpinning the budget. And as we're building the forecast, we need to check that it's accurate. And this might involve some of the formulas if we're using a spreadsheet, uh, some of the additions, some of the um, uh, transposition of numbers and figures, such that we don't end up with a wildly inaccurate budget. And the last thing we need to do is implement it. And we're gonna talk about this in, a, in a, another slide in a minute. Um, I guess you can have the best budget in the world, but if you don't implement it, if you don't check what you said was going to happen to what actually did happen, if you don't take action as a result of that, then the budget is meaningless. If you're just producing it to keep the bank happy, you're wasting a lot of time and effort because you've got some really good information here to help you manage the farm month, month to month. Um, so um, be conservative. Use your software to its advantage. Refer to some of the notes that I've actually uh, talked about. Base your budget on a farming year rather than a tax year. Uh, and apply some of these principles to try and get the best quality estimate that you can. And this will allow you to make good decisions as you go through. So I, I talked about the quality of a budget is about uh, the quality of its assumptions. And assumptions can fall into uh, three broad categories. The stuff you know is going to happen. This is where we've got 100% certainty. Um, we know our loan repayments. We know um, uh, how much we, we need to live uh, in terms of our drawings. We know our starting points. We know our business plan. We're going to look pretty silly if we don't build in the stuff we knew was going to happen into our guess of what's going to happen. Um, so uh, build in the stuff you know is going to happen with 100% certainty. Estimate the stuff that you know is going to happen, but you don't know to what extent. And this is where the guesswork comes in. Uh, educated guess, not random guess. Show me the rationale behind each one of these and make sure it's conservative and it's realistic and it's doable. It may be a stretch in some cases, but make sure it's aligned back to your business plan. What are your estimate of commodity prices? Use futures, use uh, what the bank might estimate. Um, have you allowed for inflation? Banks are very good at setting fixed rates for loans and fixed rates are an average of what they think the variable rates will be over that time period. So what is the fixed rate for the next 12 months might give you an indication of what the variable rate is doing over that 12 months. Estimate your seasonal conditions and your yields and your farm plan and the impact upon those yields. Maybe look at long range weather forecasts. Definitely look at your historical information um, and base some of your estimates on those. Thirdly, there's gonna be stuff happen that you didn't know. Uh, they come out of the blue. Um, there may be health issues on the farm, a global financial crisis may hit, uh, there's trade wars sort of happening at the moment, who knows what that may impact in the short term. Maybe decisions of farmers around you can impact on you to some degree as well. Um, and I guess this is what we have contingencies for, just in case. Or the other alternative is, well, I'll deal with them if and when they happen. So there can be a real risk in terms of budgeting that you take it too far and plan to the nth degree and worry about stuff that may or may not happen. At some point, you've got to draw the line and say, you know what, uh, I'll deal with that if and when it happens um, in the best way that I can. I've planned as much as I can. So don't get uh, trapped in that uh, uh, 
procrastinating over too much and planning too much. Uh, get the basics right, allow for some uh, contingencies and then deal with them if and when they may happen. Now, the main thing I said about a budget in terms of value to you is about comparing the actual figures to what you planned to happen. So this is covered in your notes as well, and these dot points are expanded a little bit in the notes for this, this section. But you can see some of the headings there. Um, some people have the temptation of, well, we're well off track with the budget, we'll just change it. Uh-uh. <laughs> the whole point of a budget is you have discipline and uh, you are striving to achieve it. If you just change it because you're not achieving it, it takes away that discipline. What some people do if they're well away from the budget or well in front or well behind is they may forecast where they end up at the end of the year if they remain this far ahead or behind. And that can help them make decisions in terms of preempting things. But generally, don't change the budget. Change your forecast, which is a prediction of where you'll end up now that we're three months into the season, but don't change your budget. It takes away the very point of having one and something to strive towards. When I'm analyzing a budget, I tend to look at the totals before I look at the subtotals. I look at year to date before I look at the month. And what this does is it allows me to get a sense of what's going well and what's not going well from a big picture perspective before I look at the detail. If you do a budget line by line and have lots of lines in your budget, you may forget by the time you get to the end what was at the front. But if you look at the headings and the bottom line, the end result, and you look at the year to date before you look at the month, what this does is it may take out timing differences. Okay, we were under last month, we're over this month. Don't panic, the two even each other out. Uh, and if you look at the year to date, you'll see that rather than looking at the month to month. Then I go into the detail and look at the individual lines and months. Identify material positive, negative variances. So some people say, look, if it's more than 10%, different to what I thought it was going to be, or if it's more than $5,000 difference to what I thought it was going to be, I'll investigate that further. So many people give a percentage and a dollar amount, because sometimes you have a small cost that has varied a large, uh, small dollar amount, but it's a big percentage. Sometimes you have a large cost that's only varied a small amount, um, uh, but it's a big percentage. So you need to look at the percentage as well as the dollar amount. And look at the negative as well as the positive, because as you're analyzing these figures, you want to encourage the positive to continue happening and try and mitigate the negative from happening. So don't just look at the bad things and try and stop those. Look at the good things and say, how do I continue this positive? And part of that might involve drilling down to root cause analysis rather than just looking at the symptom. As you're trying to identify what to continue doing or stop doing, ask yourself, why is it happening? And some might be quite obvious, some might be more of a root cause. Why, 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 why? And that's what the five whys is about. Ask why five times to identify the root cause, because maybe the problem you have is that you didn't plan things up front, not that you've run out. See, run out is the symptom. The root cause might be a lack of planning uh, at the start of the season. And we identified that as one of the potential wastes so by asking this why five times, you might get back to some of those root cause wastes that we identified previously. And it might not be the obvious symptom that you see. Second last dot point, consider how to continue the positive and eliminate the negative we've spoken about and review on a regular basis. I would recommend monthly. Some people might do it quarterly in line with their BAS because they're getting all the numbers and figures together. I guess my issue with quarterly is that maybe the horse has bolted and you don't have a chance to fix things up. Um, so have a think about how regularly you'd like to review your actual results to your budget. And what are some of the corrective actions you can take? And we've identified some of these in terms of some of the, the cost saving uh, strategies you could use um, in an earlier slide. But in general, how can I do more, better, same or less? So we can look at the quantity of things or we could look at the quality. Maybe we do it different, better or worse. Uh, maybe we need to maximize our revenue and the timing of sales, etc., to get the best price. 
And definitely we want to minimise our wastes, some of those root causes we identified earlier and you have in your homework activity. Um, how do we improve our cash flow? Might be some decisions you need to make by deferring certain things. Uh, at the start of the season, you might uh, structure your borrowings differently. Uh, you might review your drawings. You might sell excess assets or even defer asset purchases as you're going through the year. And we want to have some contingency plans that we might think about diversification, which we'll talk about in risk management, webinar five. Rather than buying things, maybe we could hire or lease or we could outsource rather than doing things in-house. And definitely new technology might be one of those ways by spending more, we can actually save more than it costs us. So a few different uh, ideas in terms of corrective actions you might be able to take as you're going through the season. So we're coming down to two very broad questions um, and summary of what we've spoken about so far. And the key focus of what we've talked about in this webinar is how can you improve variable costs and your margins that go along them th with them through the short term decisions that you make. And these short term decisions that you make are about improving the input between uh, the, the ratio between inputs and outputs, your productivity, your efficiency. And hopefully you can understand that a little bit better uh, and understand the impact of some of these short term decisions in that 615 uh, rule of thumb we've talked about. We've been focusing on the one. So we started by identifying the top three or four variable costs that you have as a starting point in terms of the main ones you need to focus on. And you might even benchmark those against some others or indeed against yourself. We then said, well, do some sensitivity analysis, some what ifs, what if I change this? What if I did that? And then we looked at five ways you can be more productive. Sometimes you need to invest money to save money. Sometimes you need to stop doing something. And even if it reduces your revenue, the extra cost of doing it might be more than the revenue it uh, was generating. Um, sometimes we can't see the forest for the trees. So step back and do those costs of production to see, uh, is it really worthwhile? We definitely want to reduce waste and we have identified five broad ways of reducing waste and lots of sub areas within that, as well as some specifics around livestock and uh, cropping. And lastly, we said, uh, prepare a cash flow budget and put quality assumptions in that cash flow budget to make it the best guess that you can come up with. And then regularly compare that guess, that plan, that estimate to what is actually happening to identify some of the issues and take action proactively before the problem becomes too bad and you can't do anything about it. So a bit of a summary of uh, what we've covered so far, a list of references, there's the uh, Bankwest plan farm um, and some really good stuff around cash flow with a GRDC there and gross margins um, and uh, one from Agriculture WA um, generating more profit for your farm business. So let's just wrap up with our last slide here in terms of uh, we've already done a little bit of a summary, but give people an opportunity to type any questions, especially around the cash flow budget, um, the second half of the webinar. A reminder that I'll be available between um, three and five on this coming Sunday uh, for any one on one. So if you want to email me with a preferred time in that slot and we'll try and coordinate those times. Um, your homework activity is largely around identifying your top three or four variable costs um, uh, and how you might do that against an irrelevant benchmark or against uh, absolute dollar amounts and uh, which one of the variable costs do you need to focus on. And then we say, well, what specific strategies are you going to use around uh, productivity, those five reductions of waste and um, maybe some cropping specific variable cost reductions and some livestock specific strategies and then committing to some actions um, and it might be reviewing your your cash flow more regularly uh, throughout the year or it might be even building a cash flow or improving the quality of your cash flow um, so what actions are you going to take to reduce those variable costs is the last part of your homework 
thanks very much, guys. I'll wrap up the webinar there and look forward to talking to you next week with the last of in our series of five around managing risk in your farm. Thanks very much.